morning and welcome to service this morning at Church of the Rock. I just want to be reading from 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to 17 as we continue on in our series, Abiding Love, in a message that I've entitled this week, The New Old Commandment, Love. Starting in verse 7 in chapter 2, going down through to verse 17, the Apostle John records for us that, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know who, him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from of the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is God's word. Let's pray this morning. Father, as we gather around your word, may our hearts and our minds and our spirits be quickened to hear what it is you have to say today. May we be convicted, Lord, of the things that we need to work on. May we find joy in the things that you have grown us in. And may we find a settled peace in knowing that in Christ, all of these things are available to us. If we would just step in and say to you, Father, make me what you have designed me to be so that I can be the person in this world that brings most glory to you and the edification of all those who are around me. I pray all these things, Father, as we look at your scripture this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The new way of living really is rooted in an old way of being. It's quite a confusing thing for a moment when you think about it, but C.S. Lewis once wrote that it's the deep magic found from before time began, that when a blameless one dies in the place of another, certain things begin to happen. It's one of those old commandments that Aslan brought into the new way of being in Narnia. And for us, the new old commandment is rooted in love, deeply in love. It's born through his word, and it's born out in our actions into the world as we live out what it is Jesus has called us to. Now, this past week as I was writing some personal notes and thoughts down, preparing it for this message, my mind drifted right to this series, in fact, to where we are here now in 1 John in chapter 2. Thoughts on how it is we're to understand and teach the things that he gave us in, in 2020 here and how that works itself out in the practical application of day-to-day -day living. As deep and as hard as 1 John is, and it is a very complicated short little letter, he is also intensely practical in everything that he teaches. He breaks things down in four ways in this section that we're looking at. Then he repeats himself again. It's almost as if you're reading the same verse over and over. And then at the end of this section, he gives application and assignment in a very practical way. And in imagining my mind, the very, very old grandpa sitting in a rocking chair next to the fireplace on one end of this big room with the other end packed full of all those sitting around listening to him speak very intently to the one who had walked all of these years and all of the many miles in Jesus. And I'm reminded of Spurgeon as I was sitting at my desk, often quoted by Begg in sermons that I listened to and others of the, the same thinking, when he said that the job of a preacher is not to teach all kinds of new things each and every week, but rather we are to remind you and also ourselves at the same time of things that we must never forget. 
It's not my job to reinvent the wheel or to create a new message. It is simply my job to play that one string that I have on my banjo so that we won't ever forget it. And six times, it seems to me, this is what John's doing here. Six times he writes, I write to you. I write to you. Addressing children, addressing fathers, addressing young men or young people. The word there can actually mean young people. So it's not just men. In other words, all of you. Everyone sitting in this nice little cozy room. Every one of you. I don't want any of you to think that either these things are just specifically for you or they aren't for you at all. And John Calvin, in a very old commentary, says it best in relation to this particular verses or set of verses. He says, we are so perverse that a few of us think that what is addressed to everyone belongs just to us. Old people mostly excuse themselves because they're past the age of learning. Children refuse to learn, saying that they are not yet old enough. The middle-aged do not pay any attention at all because they're occupied with other things. So then... Lest anyone exempt themselves, Calvin says, the apostle mentions three ages, the most common divisions of human life. In other words, everybody listening to me, how practical, how just simple and practical for us all to understand. Don't think that you're excluded from the work of God because you are too young. Don't think for a minute you're excluded from the work of God because you are too old or even that you are too busy. I am talking to all of you, and I can hear that ringing down through the ages right to this very moment now. Now, rote memorization. My wife and I were talking about this last week about schooling. Rote memorization, that repetition of the facts over and over and over again in order that we would remember, mostly in mathematics. Anyone knows or anyone who does know understands that this is the best way for people to learn and to retain certain things. It's to just repeat over and over and over again until it actually becomes part of our DNA. We don't even have to think about it. It's part of our memory, so much so that it becomes second nature to us. It's actually a habit that's created, and we wonder why it is our reflexes are a certain way or our thoughts go directly to certain things. It's because of constant repetition. Uh, They say it takes around 10,000 hours of practice to master anything in this world. I don't know who they are. I don't know even where they get their statistics, but it seems to be true. 10,000 hours of practice to master anything. So in other words, what's really being said here is it takes an awful lot of hard work to make things look effortless. You see, it's a lifetime that we have to dedicate to follow Jesus and to be conformed to him. Things do not happen overnight. Sometimes it feels like we're all of a sudden in a spot overnight. That's not how it works. We get there through day-to-day choices and day-to-day functions. And over and over again, before you know it, we're in a place sometimes where we want to be, sometimes where we don't. Christian life is no different than learning a new habit. We're empowered by the helper, the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us. We have access to that Holy Spirit simply by asking him for help and asking him to fill us. We have access to the power that he gives us and the ability to live in a way that glorifies God and blesses others. See, in that beautiful prayer of Jesus, once again, as we go back to John's gospel, he prays for his disciples and all who are going to come after him when he says, but now I am coming to you. He's speaking to the Father. He knows his time is short. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, Jesus is praying. Your word is truth. As you sent me into this world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. We could talk about that passage all day long, and perhaps we will in the future. But his word is truth. His word is truth. And he wants us to be sanctified that. In that, And I get a very real sense that all of these years on in John's life, as he's in his mid to late 90s, he's recalling that moment when Jesus prayed that way for them. And he finds himself now as a very old man 
overseeing a group of people who God has put under his care in much the same role as Jesus had. I pray for them, Lord, that you would not take them out of the world, but I know that they're gonna have struggles. And I pray that you would watch over them. You see, having walked out this Jesus life for the better part of six decades, John is reminding them over and over and over and over again, stay the course, hold the line. Until you get into glory, there is work to be done. And he says here in verse seven and eight, beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. See, this new old commandment, it's not a reinvention of anything. It's the word that you have heard from the very beginning. See, the message itself is always the same. It is the eternal word of God, the gospel. But the method by which that message is conveyed from generation to generation has to change. It must change. Sometimes from one immediate generation to the other in order that we are engaging the culture that we are living in in a way that they understand. That's the message. It has to be that way. And we have to be very careful about two things as a church and as God's people. And the first thing here when we're talking about the word of God is that we are never to baptize into orthodoxy the method by which that message is conveyed. Now follow with me here. I say that for a good reason because when we baptize into orthodoxy the method, when we do that, the method itself actually becomes the message. The way in which we present the gospel actually becomes the gospel. And when you change the method, folks who are so used to it being done a certain way actually think that we're watering down the truth of the gospel and the message itself. See, this is why churches split up and argue constantly over music style. It's why they argue over programs and whether we should have them or we shouldn't have them and how that works itself out. We argue over versions of the Bible. What's the best one to read and who's really going to get to heaven by reading that one and which one did Jesus really read and all of those silly things. We argue over the ways and the styles of preaching far more than we ever do over what is actually being said from the pulpits across this world. Style and all of that stuff matters a lot more than substance and content. And then we get a little bit concerned. So that's the first thing. We need to make sure that we don't mix up the message with the method. And the second thing is is to think that the Bible is only a timely type of application and message. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that, as basic as I can put it, is that we somehow, somewhere along the way, outgrow. We become too smart and far more enlightened than the Bible needs for us to be. To adhere to, su- to adhere to such archaic teachings as what Jesus talks about and what John talks about here. We've somehow advanced ourselves to the point where we're so much better. And I would simply ask that you take the time to read a newspaper. Turn on the news. Ask yourself very honestly, are we really getting better? Is the world actually getting better? Even though this is God's good world, is it getting better? Is that what's really happening in our divine age of enlightenment and forward thinking? Are people kinder? Are people more loving? You see, to love your brother is very easy to understand when I simply say it. And John says here, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Now again, there's a sermon completely in there and I would leave that with you to just think that through as we look at our world. But John continues, whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You see, in practical terms, what John is telling us here, however, in order to love our brother, it's actually much more hard to do than we would like to admit. And again, therein lies part of the problem. We aren't confronting just ourselves but our culture as a whole we have to be honest and i want to challenge us to as i said last week it is very hard to love some people let's just be real 
we have to admit that it is actually, admitting that actually is the first step to fixing that problem. Now bear with me, because most especially here in the church, oh, we're Christians. We're supposed to love one another. And there could not be a truer statement. That is true enough. But the question is, is do we? Do we actually do that? Oh, we're God's kids. We're one big happy family. Really? Have you ever come to my house at Christmas and sat down around the table or on a holiday? One big happy family, joyfully dysfunctional, around the table with sister and brother fighting and kids rolling around on the floor and mom and dad frustrated because things didn't work out the way they should. Maybe your house isn't like that, but there you go. For any of you that are in the know, I just have two words for you. Clark Griswold. I will leave that for you to think through. To recognize the truth that if we were to look around at the people that we deal with, most of us would probably not grab a beverage with many who are gathered. That's just the truth. And it's okay, I want to say to you right now as your pastor, it is okay to be frustrated with that statement and it is even okay to be offended by that statement. Don't ignore that statement though because I stand by it because it's true. Most of us would not choose the people group that churches gather together on a Sunday where God has set us down. However, however, you and I don't get to pick our families. We don't. You see, the Bible tells us that we are brothers and sisters because of what Jesus has done for us. We are his little children and brothers and sisters. So you may not want to go out for a beverage with me on Sunday afternoon, but you're stuck with me as your brother. And I'm stuck with you. And I'm very happy with that. But we have to acknowledge that in the dysfunctionalness of a family, to pretend that everything's great because we are just one happy family really loses what John is trying to say. Because once we realize that truth, then we can genuinely begin walking in the light of this commandment to love. I can look at a brother who might be unlovable, which is usually me, and I can say to that person, because he's a brother in Christ, and the grace of God has filled me, I can love that person, because Jesus loved me when I was unlovable. The N.T. Wright puts it this way, the life of God's new age is revealed as the love of God's new age. Let me say that again. The life of God's new age is revealed as the love of God's new age. All other commandments, the details of what to do and what not to do, are the outflowing of this love. The love which has been newly revealed in Jesus. The love which God now intends should be revealed in and through all those who follow Jesus. See, two weeks ago we talked about they will know we are his children by our love for one another. That has to be a deep-seated, genuine love, not lip service. You see, we really don't want to find ourselves as God's people walking around in the dark, as verse 11 says, do we? I don't want to. I don't want you to either. I want you to be in the light, not knowing where we're going, wandering around in the dark. That's not a healthy way to be. And you want to know what this looks like? Again, I want to challenge you. Just sit down and look at the news. Look at what our world looks like. Look at the wholesale collapse of dignity in our culture. The lack of respect for one another. And the lack of kind dialogue being displayed by our country. Say nothing of the rest of the world. That starts right at the White House and all the way down to the local level. Trust me, it is a donkey problem and it is an elephant problem both. So please don't send me an email complaining to me that I'm taking sides or the other. I'm not. We as a culture have lost the ability to understand where is the love that we need, the genuine love. My challenge here is that it should be shining out from us into the world. It should be pouring out and we need to shine brightly everywhere we go in everything that we do. Because here's the deal. This is what John says to us. I am writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you fathers because you know him who was from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you children's, but children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Little children, John is saying, your sins are forgiven. For Jesus' sake, that is a fact Grounded in heaven that can be not changed. This is the established truth in the kingdom of God. You are the legitimate 
children of the king because of what Jesus did. Fathers, you know him who is from the beginning, the eternal God, the eternal one who gave you life and breath, as Paul says in his discourse in Athens. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Live accordingly. Live accordingly, giving him glory that's due his name in all of the things that you do. If you are a garbage man, be the best garbage man to the glory of God. If you are a nurse, you be the best nurse to the glory of God. If you are working in children's church, wiping the noses of the little ones in the back of this building, you do so to the glory of God. I promise you, the janitor who empties buckets on a daily basis, 100% to the glory of God, will have a better day, as Paul Washer would say, on the day of judgment than the person who preached a thousand sermons half-heartedly. I don't want to be that guy that preaches half-heartedly. I don't want to be the guy that kind of loves the Lord and kind of loves his people. Young men, you have overcome the evil one. Again, remember Calvin. John is not singling any out. He's grouping us all together, making sure that they all understand and we as a result all understand as well that he is talking to every single one of them. There's nobody that's exempt if you are in Christ. You are an overcomer in this world. Do not be undone. Do not be undone. And that's going to be important for us as we look at the next section in this chapter. You're an overcomer. Do not let the enemy get to you. Don't do it. All these things John has been saying here in just different ways. Repetition. He wants them to hear what he's saying. Keep yourself. Keep yourself in Christ. Now Peter in his short little letter that's very powerful, he puts it this way. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith knowing that the same kind of suffering Sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. This is not common to just you. But stand your ground. Watch out for the enemy and how he worms his way in. There's action on our part. There's work that we have to do. It doesn't just happen all by itself. You see, one of the most beautiful things to see in the power of the Holy Spirit is the work of God by the people of God living out the word of God, to his glory and to the benefit of others. I want to say that again. One of the most beautiful things to see is the power of the Holy Spirit working the works of God by the people of God or through the people of God who are living out the word of God, which is the truth to his glory and his benefit. It's one of the best defenses against the attack of the enemy. Repeat this over and over again. As if John is saying, just in case you folks in the back aren't hearing my voice, I'm going to say it again and again and again. Children, you know the Father. Don't act like you're an orphan because you're not. You're a child of the King. Fathers, yeah, I get it. Way there in the back, straining to hear. Do you hear me? You guys know him. You ladies know him. What's a father's task? What's a mother's task? To teach and to pass on what they know. Pass it on to your kids. Pass it on to your kids. Young men, young women, pay attention. You're strong. Why? How do I know that? Because God's word is in you. God's word is in you. You are an overcomer. Because of all of these things, it is time now to get to work. Get to work. All of these things are in your possession already all because of what this little Jewish carpenter Jesus of Nazareth did for you but every one of them are absolutely useless if you don't know or if they don't exercise them and you don't exercise them putting all of these things into action in your life recognizing God's working through you and I'm reminded once again of that beautiful passage way back in the dark ages before the sickness you know February of this year when I came and I preached, Paul's letter to the Ephesians in our open and reading, and we looked at it in February, I actually preached from it. I call it the in him chapter. The in him chapter. Verses 3 through 14 that we read. And I leave that with you again to look at. But this here in summary, we are chosen. We have redemption. We have an inheritance. 
we are sealed. That means we are kept by God. And we know that we are kept by him by keeping ourselves in him. And here is the key. This is the key to that passage found in verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, theme going on here, isn't there? The gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. All of those things that Paul says in him, in Jesus, we have. We cannot lose. Why? Because they are sealed for us by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And they are for our benefit as we live in this world. The Holy Spirit himself, he's not a thing, he's not an it. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is the guarantee of all of these things in our life. Our job as his kids is found in verses 15 to 17 of John's letter. Once we really grab onto this and we discover these things. You see, this is the part of that propitiation piece that we talked about last week. That Jesus has purchased us with his life. That he stands at the law court in heaven. And God sees us through what Jesus did for us and declares us righteous because of his righteousness. The beautiful thing in that is that we are no longer orphans. We're not lost in this world. We are children of the king. That means we are royalty. Not in some twisted, weirdo way, but in in all actual fact, we are royalty. Are we behaving that way? Because of all that we've guaranteed for us through what Jesus did, the forgiveness that's found in him and his death and his burial and his resurrection, See, our salvation is honored and proven true. Hear me on this. It is honored and proven true when we do not love the world. Here's verses 15 to 17. Or the things in the world. You see, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. Now, We need to clarify a little bit here this morning about what this means because time's growing short as I'm watching the clock. The world is not the people. Say that again. The world is not the people. They're actually two entirely different things and two entirely different words in the Greek. Don't think I'm smart. I looked them up because I needed to. Not trying to impress anybody. We just need to understand that. What John is saying is the ways in which this fallen world operates. We don't ignore the people in this world. We have to fight against the way in which they operate because they are always contrary to God and His ways. Bitterness, pride, hatred, arrogance, gracelessness, injustice, racial divisions, the abuse of human beings, and the devaluing of human life all human life, from the moment of conception in a mama's womb to the last prayer that I would say at somebody's graveside, every human being has value. And that, frankly, in relation to all of the things that I just said, bitterness, pride, hatred, and all of that, this is the root of the problem that we have, that we are devaluing human beings. We are devaluing human beings. Every human being you come into contact with has value every human being. That's why we are called to love one another. Because some people are difficult to love, but that person has value in the eyes of God. The church is the only place on planet earth that has the only story which actually not only does this, but is commanded to think this way. The world does not think this way. Please don't think for a moment that it does. This is why we can't talk to one another when we're out in the world. Because the demand here in our culture right now, in a culture of offense, is that in order for you to be accepted by me, you better think like me, you better act like me, you better talk like me, or you are the enemy. And I will devalue you by belittling you, by belittling your intelligence, and by insulting your beliefs. 
This is how the world operates. That's what John means when he says, do not be a part of the world. You see, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. These things come from the world. They do not come from our Heavenly Father. They are the lies that are born in the pit of hell itself and are running rampant in our world. In N.T. Wright, once again, I just cannot avoid going to him because he is so good here. He says, the world here, like the word flesh when Paul uses it, means, quotes, the world as it places itself over and against God. The world remains God's good creation. This is why we need to take care of where we live. Can't live on the moon, not much of an atmosphere. But anyway, he says that the world remains God's good creation and as such is to be enjoyed with thanksgiving. We must celebrate all the goodness of the world, all God's goodness to us within creation, but we must not worship it. So that gets into Paul's letter in Romans where we we substitute the glory of God for creatures and created things. Ultimately, the outworking there is we devalue each other. We devalue human beings. We don't have love for each other. We can see that literally working itself out. It's far too easy to fall into the mindset of heaven up there in the world right here as though God is only right here with me when I ask him to be. No, he is right here in every one of us who are in him every day. We represent him in this world by the way in which we live, by the way in which we act, by the way in which we serve, and yes, most especially, by the way in which we love. This is the old, new commandment. John makes it clear what and who is going to last in all of these things. Verse 17, that the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Stay the course, my little children. Stay the course. Hold the line, fathers. Fight the fight, young people. Don't ever give up. The Holy Spirit, your helper, is in you, And he is working in and through you. And he is working for you to empower you. Every single one of you at every stage of life, I am speaking to you, the people whom God has put under my care. Every one of you here at the rock, at every stage of life, you are needed. You are needed. You are of value and you are a necessary contributor to the cause of Christ as it advances in this world. What is God calling you to do? You see, at the end of the course, and I'm sure at this very late stage of his race of life, the Apostle John, just think for yourself, he was a human being. John could see the tape at the end, the finish line of all things. But John was still running strong right through to the end through that tape so as to win the prize. Still teaching here. All those years later, there's a prize in it, my brothers and sisters, for them that abide in my love. But I'm going to tell you from experience, I can hear John saying now, for these past 60 years, my little children, it's not going to be the easiest of roads that you're going to travel And those pressing in against you now, and this is for all of us, but this is what John is saying, those pressing in against you now, you need to contend with. You need to fight the fight. You can never let your guard down because they come from outside. And frighteningly, frighteningly, you will also find they will also come from among you, from inside the church. But that, alas, is for us to learn next week because my time is done. Let's close in prayer. Father, as we come before you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, make the book live to us. Make the word of Christ dwell in us. 
May the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit dwell in us and work through us. As we go about this week, challenge us, Lord, to ask the hard questions. Where do you have me to serve you and your kingdom at the church that you've placed me down in and in the job that you have put me in outside of that church? Challenge us to ask that question so that we can bring glory to you in a way that this world will look at us and go, they're God's kids because they love one another and they love him and scary enough, they love us too as much as we hate them. They love us too. Father, may we be those people that love in spite of things and carry your word to a world that is deeply lost. In Jesus' name.